Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians is a, a wonderful book, um, a great book of encouragement, a book that focuses a lot on the concept of unity, that on the concept of working together towards a common goal, specifically throughout the, the uh, writings uh, to the church at Ephesus. You see a lot of this idea of setting aside one's own thoughts and intentions for the sake of unity. I'm willing or a willingness to set aside my own uh, joys or the things that I strive for within my own heart for the specific purpose of serving God in a unified manner with others. And the same thing goes and is carried over as it pertains to our giving. And continuing and talking about what we were talking about this morning with this concept of godly giving. What is, what is it that I can do? What life can I live? How can I work? How can I provide? How can I give in a way that is pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God? And what we see in Ephesians chapter 4 is we see a very wonderful verse that talks about some beautiful concepts, in my opinion. If you look at verse 28, and there's a few passages that we're going to look at. And in fact, if, if you didn't already turn to Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, I'd encourage you to go over to Acts 20 as well. We're going to spend a little bit more time there, which coincidentally um, is written to uh, the church at Ephesus in, in the same way, or at least the encouragement to the elders at Ephesus uh, from Paul. Uh, however, let's, let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, in verse 28, notice what it said here, very simply. Let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give, who, uh, give him excuse me, who has a need. Notice this stepping stone, if you will, or this progressive nature of this verse. There's this concept of this one who has held back or has stolen. We, we talked about a little bit about a concept like this in Malachi chapter 8 about this concept of robbing God by not giving as I should. But in Ephesians chapter 4, notice this is this charge for an individual to stop stealing, but rather to gain an earnest and honest living. Notice that second part there, but rather let him labor. So not steal, but labor. Notice this, working, working what his hands, what is good, for what specific purpose? It's not just so that he would stop stealing. It's not just so that he gains an earnest or honest uh, wage for what he has done, but he works diligently. Why? So that he is able or has something to give to him who has a need. When it comes to our giving, the first thing that we're going to look at tonight is that sometimes we have to work to give. This morning, two of the concepts that we mentioned, uh, we're focusing primarily upon the concept that God has already given us all things. If you'll be reminded of what we read all the way back in Psalm chapter 24, and verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness, the world and those that dwell therein. So everything that we possess is first given to us by God, even going so far as to give His own Son. And then we talked a lot about greed, how our greed affects us, how it affects others, how it hurts us eternally how it hurts our relationship with God, and how it makes us even to be at times seen as foolish in the eyes of God. But what I want us to focus on tonight, at least for the first half of the sermon, is focusing on the concept of diligently working for the specific purpose of being able to be generous or being able to give. When you wake up tomorrow, and any of those who are, uh, well, it's Memorial Day, so probably a lot of people are off. When you wake up on Tuesday, for those who still work, and you wake up and you get ready and you're putting on your, your uniform or your outfit that you wear to work and you're getting ready to get in your car and you're on your way to work, is your motivation to go and work that day so that you can be able to, to help or it, so that you can be able to be generous to others who are in need? It's a little bit of a strange concept, right, at times. You know, I get up, I'll go to work. I get dressed, I drive my car, I go put in the hard hours. Why? So that I can take care of myself, or so that I can take care of my family, or so that I can have nice things. The concept that is seen throughout Scripture is this concept of laboring, not just for oneself, but laboring for the specific purpose of being able or capable to be generous to others. That my specific purpose within working is not just to take care of myself, but also to keep in mind the needs of others and meet those needs in a very caring way. This concept is, is very strong even in the Old Testament, but specifically it gets a lot stronger once you get into the kingdom principles in the New Testament. 
In fact, I mentioned Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. I'd encourage us to flip over to Acts 20. We're going to start back in verse 32. And remember, uh, this is during the uh, exhortation of the Ephesian elders. And in verse 32, this is what is mentioned concerning the work which they had done in, in support of, uh, of Paul. Uh, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to, the wor- and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Acts 20 verse 33 says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way that by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Notice what is said here as the focus of the work. I have shown you that in every way, by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. Now, when we get up and we wake up and we go to our jobs, we don't often think about going to work for the specific purpose of caring for other people's needs, seeking to take care of the needs of those who the Bible describes as weak, not in a sense that they're lesser than, but maybe not as physically capable to take care of themselves. If you'll be reminded, uh, when Jesus, well, I say when Jesus, on multiple occasions, Jesus makes mention of two specific groups that he mentions should be a priority in each of our minds, the fatherless and the widows, each of which are to be taken care of, uh, even by the congregation as a whole, but specifically on an individualistic level. You'll be reminded of Jesus' encounters when he talked with his disciples or when he talked with the Pharisees, when he talked with the scribes or the Sadducees or just about anybody who he came in contact with at some point. He made mention of this concept of working hard or laboring hard in order to be able to take care of the needs and necessities of others. This is not to be done in in a lazy way. What I mean by that is that you don't work just so that somebody else doesn't have to. But for somebody who is not capable of caring for the, their needs, that's why we work. That's why we go to our jobs. That's why we labor constantly. And once again, when's the last time that we woke up with the intention of I am going to work today so that I can help to meet the needs of others? It's a foreign concept. At least you know, I might be on my own little island there. I might be the only one who thinks like that, but I'd, I'd be willing to bet that I'm probably not. Because we have this concept of we, we meet our needs. We take care of ourselves, and then when the plate comes around on Sunday, then we put some into there as well to meet the needs of the church. But it seems as if the concept is is clear throughout Scripture, especially throughout the New Testament. We labor, we work, we strive to help to meet the needs of those who are in need. One of the things that we mentioned this morning was uh, the concept introduced. We didn't go directly to it, but the concept that is introduced in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2 Um, Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, is encouraging them to gather a collection together to do so upon the first day of the week so that when Paul arrives, that that there's not a a collection being needed at that moment. Uh, When we see, and I want to make sure, I've I've mentioned it time and time and time again because uh, for the longest time I misunderstood the concept when I was a kid for some reason. I always thought that so there'd be no collection when I come is when Jesus returns, we don't want any money in the bank. No, Paul is saying when I get to Corinth, the last thing that I need to be doing is taking up a collection. So as you gather upon the first day of the week, give as you have prospered. Notice the, the few concepts that he introduces here. Some that we carry over into our giving and some that we should meditate upon a little bit more. Notice upon the first day of the week, let each one lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Okay, upon the first day of the week, we've done that. We did that this morning. We'll have the opportunity to do that again tonight for those who were not able to be here this morning and do so. It, it, let each one of you lay something aside. Well, we, we, we pretty much do that as well. We're good at that. We budget for this moment in which the plate is passed around. Storing up as he may prosper. Notice that word prosper. The word prosper is indicative of the fact that there is something that has been done that has allowed for you to, to receive the blessing that you have. We made mention this morning of the, um, the fool that is mentioned uh, in Luke chapter 12. This concept of the ground had prospered. It wasn't him specifically, maybe, that, that it caused the ground to, to prosper. It might have been some work that he did, but ultimately it was a gift from God. But whatever it is that was the case, he prospered. And instead of giving back, he stored up. And so we have this concept introduced in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, that as we have prospered, as God has blessed us, we have the opportunity to give back. So that we have the opportunity to, to lay by 
uh, and, and give back unto the Lord upon the first day of the week. Notice also in Acts chapter 4. I love, uh, I love Acts chapter 4. Um, you, you, get, you get this moment of transition um, from the book of John into the book of Acts, and you, you get these wonderful accounts of all these wonderful things. And John, of course, is written it later, uh, later than the rest of the three Gospels, at least, and gives us a very specific look into the life of Jesus and specifically focuses upon his God-likeness, uh, what, what makes him to be God in the flesh. And then when you get into Acts chapter 1, you get this, this uh, moment where you've got the apostles, and it's after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, uh, and they're, they're, they're a little bit... Uh, baffled as to what's going to happen. They were warned to go and to wait in Jerusalem that the kingdom would come with power and then they should take the message to, to, to um, uh, Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the othermost parts of the world. You get all these wonderful things. And then the, the Spirit finally arrives in Acts chapter 2. And they teach the message concerning the gospel. At the end of Acts chapter 2 and verse uh, 42, we also see a very similar message that is mentioned. But then in Acts chapter 4, um, you, you begin to see as this, this congregation, the, these churches... This church that has formed and the many congregations that have formed from it, from the teachings of the day of Pentecost, begin to act out the teachings of Jesus and his kingdom. The, the very same things that Jesus came to, to teach and instill within the disciples is now being instilled within these individuals and in, in, in the great multitudes. And notice what is said specifically here in Acts 4 and verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, notice this, and of one soul, Neither did anyone say that any of these things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. All right, let's put Acts 4.32 to the test. Tonight, after services, I'm going to come over to somebody's house. I'm going to sit in your recliner. I'm going to go to your fridge, pull out some of your food, maybe get one of your sun drops out of the fridge, Drink one of those sun drops, cut on your TV and change it to whatever channel I want. And when it's time for bed, I'm going to go get in your bed. And I'm going to wake up in your bed and I'm going to put on your clothes the next morning. We're going to go to a male's house, so that's, you know, not the whole cross-dressing thing. But it's a weird concept for us to consider. And, of course, that's a far extreme of what was going on here in Acts chapter 4. But notice what it said here. Neither did anyone say that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. The first century church, the church from its core, from its beginning, was a church that recognized that the possessions, the physical earthly possessions, were of no importance as it pertained to the kingdom of God in the sense that those all took a lesser state of, of, of interest or importance within their lives concerning the kingdom of God. Everybody had all things in common. What does that mean by that? Well, you go back to Acts chapter 2 and you see just after the establishment of the church, you've got all these people who have been baptized, all these people who are continuing in the apostles' doctrine and their teachings, and people start running out of food. They're not at home. They're in Jerusalem. They're, they're far from their homes. They start running out of food. They didn't plan maybe to stay that long. And so what happens? People start taking their possessions and selling them at the markets. Why? So that they can provide food for others. The things that they held uh, to high esteem, the things of great value within their own lives were sold so that the needs of others could be met. This verse isn't telling us that we just walked in anybody's home and said, well, that's mine now. No, this is said that we should not place a higher value on our possessions than we do on the needs of others. If there's something of value that I have, no matter how precious it may seem to me, but I have held it in such high esteem, even that above of my service to the Lord, then something needs to change. Something needs to be different. Now, we don't like things like this. It makes us uncomfortable because it seems a little bit radical in a sense. When's the last time that you uh, sold a car or sold a house or sold some very special vase to you to help meet the need of somebody else? It's, it's a strange, out-of-the-ordinary concept. I think that's part of the reason why it's in the Bible, specifically within the New Testament and its teachings. Jesus' teachings were strange. They were abnormal. When Jesus came to this earth and he said that you're to do things like turn the other cheek. What? Have you not heard about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? And now you're telling me to turn the other cheek? All that you have heard, but I say unto you statements are countless moments where Jesus is saying, listen, things are different now. Things are not like they used to be. 
This kingdom is, is far, greater than, far, far greater than anything in this world. It's far more different than anything in this world. Things are going to be a little bit weird at times. And that even means that things that I hold as valuable within my own heart that are physical possessions are to take a secondary position within my heart and within my mind so that I can help to meet the needs of others. Notice uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9. Very beautiful uh, selection of scripture the book of Proverbs is. And it's, it's got a whole bunch of uh, quick pithy statements. We talked a little bit about that in our wisdom psalms uh, in our psalm class on Sunday morning. We talk about these, just this brief moment, just this quick little something of wisdom. Notice the charge given in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increases. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Well, I do give. I, I, I do make sure that when the plate comes around that I give back to the Lord on Sundays. Yes, that's, that's included within this. But also included within this is using the blessings that God has given you to help to benefit others, to help to bless others. If you look at uh, the concept of hospitality in Scripture, and once again, uh, this will, we'll talk a lot about hospitality at the beginning of the year. Um, but if you look at hospitality throughout uh, Scripture, it's very clear in Scripture that if God has blessed you with a home, you use it to be hospitable. If God has blessed you with transportation, you use it to help others who are in need of transportation. If God has blessed you with food, you use it to feed others. If God has blessed you with money, you use it to take care of the needs of others. Anything that God has blessed you with is to be used in a way that brings glory and honor to the kingdom. In fact, I was uh, doing some reading on some, some first century church uh, material. And one of the things that was mentioned was a common practice among the first century church. If they were to be building a new home... And you've got this establishment of home. You've got a, a young married couple that's going to be building a home together. It was common practice, especially within the, the first century church, to build an extra room specifically for the purpose of being hospitable. Now, do we do that? I don't know about y'all, but the Britons, we have, we have a guest room. Most of the time it's filled with our family when they come into town. Not many, not many guests, but we have a guest room. A lot of, Americans, a lot of American homes have guest room, uh, guest rooms. But in the first century church, it wasn't just a guest room. It was meant to be a place where hospitality was shown to its fullest extent. Not just to having somebody over for a meal, but a meeting the needs of somebody who is without. You think about the words hospital or hotel, a place for someone to stay in a temporary nature. A hospital, of course, being for the specific purpose of being able to be healed or have their needs met physically that allow for them to be healed. Or for a hotel, you know, somebody's traveling. This, that, you know, that's the same root. We get the word hospitable. This meeting somebody's need, whether it be temporary in a physical nature due to somebody traveling or temporary in a physical nature due to somebody needing of, of recovering. When's the last time that we opened our doors to somebody who was a stranger? Welcomed them into our home the last, person, the last time that we saw somebody who was homeless. It's a weird concept for us. It's abnormal at times. And yet this is a concept that's seen in Scripture, that the people of God are to be hospitable and are to use the possessions which God has given us to bring glory and honor to the church. There's one last section I want us to look at. Uh, before we get to the looking at the eternal inheritance, I want us to just kind of summarize what we talked about just for a second on working, uh, specifically uh, working for the Lord there, or working to give. Uh, it should be the case that it is within each of our hearts that we labor diligently not just for the benefiting of ourselves, but for the benefiting of others in the meeting of their needs. And that might look a little weird at times. That might be a, a little bit strange. It might make you feel uncomfortable. But that's the purpose. If this world is truly seen as not our home within our hearts, if this world is truly seen as a temporary dwelling place, then the cares of this world and the things of this world should not be so important within our lives that we fail to meet the needs of others who are in need. I know that's weird. I know that's uncomfortable at times. And I know that might put us in some awkward situations or uncomfortable situations. But I think, uh, I think a little, little awkwardness wouldn't hurt us every now and then. Let's look at this idea of an eternal inheritance. You know, I, there's one reason specifically that I wanted to mention this last. Um, I don't want us to give just because it allows or, or, or gets us in a better position of going to heaven. 
I don't want you that when the plate gets passed around, when, I don't want me that when the plate gets passed around, that the reason why I'm putting money in the plate is because I'm afraid of going to hell. I want us to give because we love God and because we love others. And that should be the desire of each of our hearts. Not because I'm afraid of not inheriting that eternal kingdom uh, that is set for the, the righteous, but because I love God and I love His people and I see value within His creation. So the reason I put this idea of eternal inheritance last is because it is important. It can be used, it can be used as motivation. It is encouraging even. But it should not be the only reason why we seek to give or the only thing that we use as motivation to give back unto the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. It's an inheritance. We diligently seek to inherit what God has set for us in the eternal kingdom, in the, the place where we will dwell with Him for eternity. Matthew chapter 6 and Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, He even makes mention of not laying up treasures for yourself on this earth, but to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Notice verse 19. Do not lay up for your, uh, yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, nor, uh, excuse me, uh, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, notice this, there your heart will be also. Very similar to what we talked about in James, is it not? The, the, the moth-eaten, corroded possessions that we have of this earth will be used a, a, against us, will be uh, witnesses against us upon the day of judgment. Very similar message here, this concept of don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Why? Because these things are temporary. They're moth-eaten, they're easily stolen, they break down, they rust, they're destroyed, this, that, and the other. But I think what is mentioned in verse 21 is very important, especially for us grasping the concept of why it's important for us to not lay up treasures on this earth. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If our treasure, and I want to say this in the most straightforward way possible so that we truly understand what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 6. If our treasure, if our love is of the things of this world, there your heart will be also. Seems like I remember somebody teaching about not serving two masters. You can either serve God or serve mammon. Uh, this, this concept of serving mammon is, is literally uh, placing within, uh, within that context, is literally talking about serving money as your God. And so when we see Jesus say here, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You can guarantee that wherever your heart is, there will your dwelling place be also. If my heart truly is set on focusing on serving the Lord, if my heart truly is set on focusing on taking care of the needs of others, then I will serve the Lord and meet the needs of others. But if my heart is set upon the temporary things of this earth, if my heart is meditating upon the earthly treasures, well then we can rest assured that our Savior will look to those things as a witness against us. I also want us to look at this concept just give me a few more minutes, Magnolia. <laughs> She's got a new favorite word. I don't know if y'all have caught it yet. It's dada, which I am super excited about. And when she gets really upset and starts crying, she starts saying mama, which I'm also okay with. You know, <laughs> she cries. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. Command that those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, notice this, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives all who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Is it not the case that at times when we put our heart or when we put our love or when we put our trust in riches that we become haughty? Notice the command that those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or to trust in these uncertain riches but rather to trust in the living God who gives us richly the things all the things to enjoy. We can also know 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap also sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap also bountifully. If I'm wanting to, uh, for instance, you know, a lot of people are, are, are real big into gardening, especially right now. If I'm wanting to uh, sow many seeds, if I want a lot of plants, I've got to put in the work. I've got to put in the, the effort. If I want to inherit that eternal kingdom, I need to put in some effort. I need to be willing to make sacrifices, even if that means that I set aside the things of this physical earth. 
1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 7, just a few verses before we get into this concept of commanding those who are rich not to be haughty. Uh, we see in verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. I mentioned the concept that uh, I, I, I preached, I want to say it was in Laverne, I preached one time on, on a concept similar to this. And, you know, I mentioned that, uh, that age-old uh, preacher saying, you know, you, you never see a, a, a hearse uh, towing a U-Haul. And somebody showed me a picture of a hearse towing a U-Haul. So apparently you've seen it once. <laughs> it's happened once at least. But the concept is clear. When we leave this earth, all of the things that we worked hard for physically upon this earth, they remain here. You know, I often see, uh, growing up as, a, as a, a preacher's kid, I, I went to a lot of funerals growing up. Now, being a preacher myself, I've, I've been to a lot of funerals. See people in their, in their Sunday best in the casket. And even once that casket is closed, we might think, well, that, you know, that's going with them. Well, no, it's not. That's here. That's with that body. That's with this vessel. They have gone to be with the Lord or gone to await judgment. And, and the things that they possessed, all the things that they possessed... Remain here. They do not go with you. And I think that's a good concept for us to consider. And we think about it in a, in a sense, at least in my mind, it comes up from time to time within my heart and within my mind. And I think about, oh, that's a good thought. That's a good idea. But what about in practice? How often do we truly meditate on, upon the fact that every day when you get up and you go to work and you work for all these nice things, that one day these are not going to be yours anymore. One day you're not going to be here. And all those possessions that you work so diligently, that you work tirelessly for, that you put in countless hours just to get some shirt or some face or some TV or some car or some house, none of those things are going to matter. None of those things are going to be of value. In fact, some of those things might even be used against us when we stand before God in judgment. I would like to close with Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. I think this is a good challenge for us to keep in our hearts and in our minds. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth. Set your mind upon the things above and not upon the things of this earth. I think that's a beautiful concept for us to keep within our hearts and within our minds. I think that's something that we should consider every day that we wake up that we diligently seek, not for the things of this earth, but specifically to focus upon the things which are set above us. Have you ever heard of practicing? I know any of us who've ever played sports have probably put in countless hours of practice in some form or fashion. And I've been reading a book lately talking about practicing being a Christian. Not in the sense that it's phony, that it's fake, or that it's, you know, you're just going through the moments, uh, movements, I mean. But diligently seeking on a day-to-day -day basis on a moment-by-moment -moment basis to do something that helps us to be better servants of Christ. Something that we're going to start uh, beginning tonight. I've, I've called it homework in times past, and people hate the word homework. So we're going to call it practicing. We're going to practice this week. Here's our practice for this week. When I say things like, set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, we're going to practice that in a very true and meaningful way. I don't know about y'all, but when I go shopping for groceries or whatever it may be, getting gas, there are often things that I find in my cart that are not necessities, but are wants. Not needs, but wants. So here's our practice this week. If you find yourself shopping, whether it be at Walmart or on Amazon or at Johnson's or anything like that, you go to the Dollar General on Tuesdays, I don't know. When you find yourself in that position, look before you check out. Find something that is a want, not a need, but a want, and put it back. When you go to put it back, put it back where it belongs so you don't make it harder for the workers, first off. But look how much it was, uh, how, look how much it cost. Look at the value of that thing that you put back. Do it with two or three items. Look at the value of those things. Then take that sum and go help somebody else with it. Whether that be putting it in the collection plate next week to go help the missionaries that we support or go help some of the local works that we do. Whether that be that you see somebody who is in need, who is hungry, who is thirsty, who is in need of a place to stay. Use that same value of something that you would have spent on a want, on a personal desire, on the thing of this earth that is not of any true, real value to you. 
and go use it to help somebody who is of true, real value to God. Take something that God has blessed you with and use it to bless others. That's our practice for this week. Take something that God has blessed you with and use it to bless others. When we think about the concept of giving, we can, we can recoil at times. I know when I think about things I want to preach on, this is not in the top ten things you want to preach on as a preacher. It makes you feel uncomfortable uh, in the pulpit at times. Uh, but I think it's necessary for us to have genuine, open, and honest conversations and look in the Scripture and see there are things that we do that we could do better. And this is one of them. There are ways that we could improve our relationship with the Lord, and this is one of them. There are things that I need to personally work on, my own self, not focusing on the things of this world, but focusing upon the needs of others, ultimately in my service to the Lord. All right, Magnolia, I'll quit. <laughs> that I need to work on and do better. Maybe it's the case tonight that the thing that needs to be the priority of your heart is not meeting the needs of others, but meeting the spiritual needs of you. Maybe you are doing good at meeting the needs of others, but you have some spiritual need in your life. Maybe you are not in a right relationship with the Lord and you need to put on Christ in baptism. Be washed away and cleansed of all unrighteousness, rising to walk in newness of life. Or maybe it's the case, like many of us here, that we've already been baptized. We've already been forgiven of our sins, but maybe we have gone into a life of sin. We have done things that are displeasing in the sight of God. We're no longer living in a way that is faithful. Maybe not being generous enough. Maybe not being uh, giving enough. Maybe not focusing upon the needs of others is that thing. We can pray with you. We can pray for you. We can strengthen and encourage you. Or maybe it's the case this tonight that all you simply need is encouragement. And this is something I struggle with. It's something I have issue with. I know the Bible says to not set my, my heart on the things of this earth, but to set my, uh, my heart on the things that are out of this world to not to lay up treasures on earth, but to lay up treasures in heaven. I understand that. I see it in Scripture. I've heard the words of Jesus. I've seen it in my own Bible. I've heard it from the pulpit. That's just hard for me. We can pray with you. We can pray for you. We can strengthen and encourage you. We have an opportunity at the end of each of our services, and this is that opportunity to help those who are in need. So if you need to be baptized, need to repent, or need prayers of strength and encouragement from the congregation, please come now while we stand and while we sing. Please be seated. If you're present tonight and haven't had the opportunity earlier in the day to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper, it has been kept prepared for you. If you'll come and be seated on the front seat while we sing number 92, uh, you'll be served. Oh, my love, dear Christ. 